This week on Outdoor Oklahoma, we reminisce about the heyday of Oklahoma's quail hunting and talk about what it'll take to see those days return. Then we get tips on catching a mess of wintertime crappie. Right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Yeah, that's a beauty. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Crappie fishing during the winter months is usually considered a lake activity, you know, fishing deep over brush piles. But today, we'll show you another way that you can fill your stringer full of crappie by fishing upstream from the lakes and the creeks and rivers during the dead of winter. But first, you don't have to be a quail hunter to know that quail numbers have dramatically fluctuated over the last few decades. Back in its heyday, Oklahoma quail hunting was hard to beat. And when talking with a passionate, lifelong quail hunter from back in those days, well, it can almost seem magical. And honestly, it pretty much was. Passenger pigeons once thrived in the United States. Millions upon millions darkened the sky during their nomadic migrations across the eastern and central United States in the early 1800s. But only a century later, the passenger pigeon was extinct. The sad story resonates with 73-year-old Logan County resident Keith Nip. Not only as the lamentable loss of a species because of irresponsible human activities, but because he can see the similarities today with another bird species, the northern bobwhite. An avid quail hunter since the mid-50s, Keith has personally experienced the highs and lows of this upland game bird's existence in Oklahoma. I don't think we'll ever see again like uh like it used to be. Keith recalls hunting birds in the late 50s and the early 60s. The hunting was unbelievable. It, it, it was kind of like what I pictured the, the passenger pigeon must have been when there were so many birds like that. But nobody could foreseen then that quail were gonna go through these up and down cycles like they've done. He was born in 1946 and was raised in southwest Oklahoma City. He thinks he must have been about eight or nine years old when he first began shooting with shotguns. It was the environment we grew up in. I mean, everybody hunted and fished and go down the crawdad hole and catch crawdads. Well, we were poor and just didn't realize it. So hunting and fishing was more than just a sport. It put food on the table. A kid down the block, uh, a couple years older than me, he grew. He was lived uh, west of me, and we would get together and go with our shotguns, and we'd shoot squirrels, rabbits, quail if we'd lucky enough to get into it, and we killed one goose in eight or nine years. It was about 1957 when Keith went on his first serious quail hunting trip. When I really started bird hunting, it was when the first trip out western Oklahoma. Uh, I thought I'd uh, died and went to heaven. As many quail as we saw crossing the roads. I mean, you're going down, you're going down the highway three and the birds would be just getting up flying cubbies across the road. The quail hunting was good back then. The typical hunt he went on would have four or five hunters spread out at the edge of the field in a line. They would walk in a row and then walk back, flushing cubbies all along the way. He said the bag limit back then was 10 birds a day. Once I ended up learning how to shoot, uh, I, I would, I'd get a limiter close to it every, just about every time we went. My mom would cook them up for breakfast and biscuits and gravy and quail. Pretty hard to beat. The 1970s also brought about quality quail hunting, Keith recalled. You, you could find places out in western Oklahoma you could you and your dog and your buddy. Dog goes on point, you come up behind the dog on point. The birds flush, you shoot, and they fly out across the terrain. And about halfway down there, they'd pick up another cubby that would just get up and go with them. And then they'd go land on a hillside and you'd just head out towards them. Before you could get there, your dogs are pointed a third cubby. It, it, was, it, was, it was really easy to limit out. 
He went quail hunting every chance he could get, and he'd take vacation time scheduled around hunting. As a pipeline worker, he had jobs across the country and was able to learn how the hunters in other states pursued quail. When he was about 10 years old, Keith was given a hunting dog called a dropper, which is half pointer and half setter. That's when I really got into it. I didn't have time for fishing. All I wanted to do was either mess with that dog or look at him hunting quail. At the height of his dog days, Keith was caring for 27 dogs at a time. It's a lot of work, but that, that way you don't wear your dog down, change out dogs. In the good days of the 1960s and early 70s, his dogs got plenty of work, but then the number of birds started dwindling. Quail hunting was slow in the 1980s, and by year 2000, it was really tough, he said. He could only recall one year since when bird hunters had a pretty good season. And a, lot of, a lot of hunters at that time, and I was one of them, thought we should go back to quail days. But, you know, the biologists and stuff say that that's really not, hunting doesn't affect the overall numbers. My name is Tell Judkins. I'm the upland game biologist with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. You know, anybody that's hunted quail in the state of Oklahoma or anywhere in North America for that matter, they've noticed that quail numbers have dropped, especially over the last 20 or 30 years. And anybody that's hunted that long or even a few years has formed their own opinion on why our quail numbers have gone down. You see, Everyone thinks that it could be disease or predators or things like that when realistically all of these causes of quail mortality or quail death are pretty much a constant no matter what the population is. Whether it's 3 million or 300,000, that number is just taking a very fine little snip off the bottom. Realistically, we have two main problems that impact our quail quite negatively. One is our Oklahoma extreme weather. Now, I know you and I know me, we don't have any control over the weather. If we were, we'd be some very rich people. But the main thing that we can help out with is habitat, the land, the house for that quail, making sure that it has everything right there readily available that that quail is gonna want throughout a year period. Things like native grasses, things like escape cover, loafing cover, nesting cover, and bare ground are very important for our quail here in Oklahoma and throughout the Bob White Range. So throughout the years, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation noted the decline as well as our hunters. And so we decided we would start doing something about it. So we started looking into it on the research side to figure out what was happening to our quail. We've looked at things like disease when partnering with uh, Texas to find out what diseases were impacting our birds. We've looked at habitat and movement with Oklahoma State University and still do today. Looking at areas like Pack Saddle and Beaver River and Sandy Sanders and Cross Timbers and areas all throughout Oklahoma to try to really pin down what is happening. When ultimately we find that areas that have good habitat are the only areas that have quail. And if you would like to do more, feel free to contact us, myself or any of our private lands biologists, and we can come out to your property to do an assessment to figure out what can be done to improve habitat for quail. You can also partner with groups like Quail Forever or Pheasants Forever that do a lot here in Oklahoma to really impact and, and make a positive step in Bob White and scaled quail and pheasant habitat. Got a friend from New Jersey, that, and he's an avid quail hunter, but he, he said that the quail there in New Jersey and North Carolina and stuff, they just dried up and went away. And that's why all, all the hunters that we've run into in the motels are telling us the same thing. You guys are how lucky to live here in Oklahoma where you got quail. Keith is committed to keeping and training his dogs, and he's committed to keep hunting as long as he's able. He's also committed to keeping the hunting tradition alive for future generations. So, some of the best hunts I've ever had in my life have been on public ground. Today, Keith has as many hunting dogs as he has grandchildren, eight. And I gave all, every one of them the opportunity if they wanted to learn to hunt and handle guns. His advice to kids who want to start hunting? Get involved in conservation groups such as Quail Forever, National Wild Turkey Federation, and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. But I'm glad to see outfits like Quail Forever that's doing things with habitats and stuff. It's, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's 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 making some headway. For Keith Nip, hunting is not about bagging game, 
It's about watching his dogs, seeing sights like a mature buck running across the field, and simply being outdoors. You know, Mr. Nip mentioned that some of his very best hunts have been on public lands. And over the last 50 years, since our very first public lands atlas was printed, well, we've more than doubled the number of areas in our state. And if you add in the OLAP program lands that are being added nearly every month, well, it's hard not to be optimistic about the future of quail in Oklahoma. When it comes to wintertime crappie fishing, most folks probably associate it with fishing in a lake deep over brush piles. And while that method certainly has filled a lot of fish fryers over the years, it's not the only winter method. Well, today we are gonna try to catch some crappie in one of the creeks that feeds Lake Texoma. And it is winter time, in fact, it's February 14th. Valentine's Day, as a matter of fact. And nothing says I love you fellas like bringing your wife home a nice fresh mess of crappie fillets. You're welcome. Now most people don't think about creek fishing for crappie in the winter time and the lake temperature is still quite low right now. It's about 43 degrees in Lake Texoma. And crappie usually don't spawn here in Oklahoma, meaning run up the creek to reproduce until the water temperature is in the mid to upper 50s. But a lot of times crappie will find a hole in the creek where it's got plenty of depth and most importantly lots of bait fish where they'll basically congregate or stage waiting for the conditions to be optimal for that reproductive run up the creek. And so it's a good time while they're in there feeding and getting their fat and energy reserves built up to, to catch a few and that's what we're going to try to do today. Now I'll be the first to admit that I'm a cat fisherman by trade, used to 11 foot surf rods and 4 ounce bell sinkers and 30 pound test line, so I probably lack the finesse to be a, a good crappie fisherman. I'm certainly no expert, but willing to give it my best shot today. Everybody enjoys catching crappie and particularly eating them, and I'm no exception to that rule. Top secret. All right, got a fish on the string. Hopefully he doesn't tell his buddies what happened. Hey Dave, you want one of these? I'm gonna try a little bit longer. If you catch another one, I might get interested. Okay. Yeah, any of the lakes here in Oklahoma, in fact, the vast majority of them do hold crappie. And all crappie will, of course, spawn in the spring. And if there are creeks, which there are in 99% of the cases that feed these lakes, or even rivers, they will go up the river or creek a certain distance till they find a suitable place to stage. And like I said, that usually entails having deep enough water where they won't freeze out because it is still winter time. But most importantly, having lots of bait fish like little shad and minnows that they can feed on and really fatten up because it's an energy exhaustive trip to reproduce and make that next generation of crappie. So they're, they're not moving a whole lot at that point. Now, of course, there are crappie that still stay in the lake and they'll spawn along rocks and so forth. But those that do like to run up the creeks, you can often find them in holes that have some depth and have some prey fish in the dead of winter time. What'd you catch that one on, Zach? Just dark colored. Yeah. Curly. Yeah. That first one was on the other kind. What you got, Dave? Little crappie. Yeah, that's big enough to eat. Nice one. Yeah, that was a dark one too. It only took 250 throws, but we got him. Mm. You, uh, I made my own original stringer here, Todd. If you've ever seen one like it or not. I cut the uh, eyelet off the bottom. You know, if you get a, not that I'm gonna have trouble with it today, but if you get a lot of fish, you've gotta take them off one by one, you know. And I just took a little piece of half inch pipe, light walled pipe, and drilled three holes in it. And then uh, wrapped my stringer through there three times and back over itself on the bottom. And when you get ready to take them off, all you have to do is unlatch your stringer, take your pipe off, and they all slide right off the stringer. So.
Yeah, that was fun. I'm going old school today. As you can see, I've got my 1970s model Zebco 606 spooled with 12 pound test line because that's the lightest I had at home. I've got an old medium light two piece rod here, but it kept flying apart on me, so I put a little JB weld on there, problem solved. And that'll probably be why I won't catch a fish today, but I'm gonna give it a try. Gonna be using that eighth ounce jig head there. This one's kind of a green and yellow, chartreuse and yellow. I've got a little grab bag. I'm gonna start with a dark jig body. Try it first. And let's see what I have here. I think I'm gonna try one of these uh, dark colored, tri-colored swirl tails. It's about a two inch uh, twirl tail grub basically. And it's got a, a brown and a light purple body and a chartreuse tail. So that'll be the first thing I try. And we've got lots of other colors and supplies we can try if that doesn't work. And crappie are finicky, so it may take a while to get honed in on them. Now, if that's not a slab, I don't know what is. Hold that thing up here. Oh, I cool. Some people fish their whole life for a slab like that, Zach. Or five minutes. Quality, not quantity. I'm not Bill dancing him, he's a nice crappie. <laughs> How's that for a save of the day? Came off at the bank. All's well that ends well. That's a that's a nice slab crappie right there. We'll take him. But they're in here. They just haven't been turned on to the bite. But just the last five minutes, we've caught two nice ones, and that's crappie for you. Finicky. They're liable to come on when you least expect it. So you have to stay with it and change up your gear and your jigs quite a bit just to find out what they're after. And right now they're hitting dark colored curly tail jigs. So see if we can catch another one. Is that Pomoxis annularis? Is that right? Pomoxis annularis. Scientific name. Now, white crappie, they have, if I'm not mistaken, five to six of those spiny dorsal spines, the ones that stick you, and a black crappie have seven or eight. That's how you tell them apart. And these have the, the vertical banding there with kind of some green blotches. But most of what you'll catch is white crappie, but there are black crappie around too, and it'd be nice to get into one of those as well. Better string him up. He almost got away once. I'm not There's one. White curly tail coming through. Yeah, that's a beauty. <clears throat> Back to white now, Zach. Back to white? Yeah, it was pure white. Yeah, but not much, not getting aggressive at all. That's a wrap. Well, we didn't slay them, but Got enough for supper, didn't we? Yep. I'm satisfied. You get eaten size fish.
Man, that last fish that Zach caught was a huge crappie. I guess I'm gonna need to mix it up a little bit on how and where I fish for crappie in the winter. And even though quail numbers have been higher in the past, it doesn't mean that there's no hope for the future. Rest assured that we'll continue to learn everything we can and work tirelessly with landowners so that when weather patterns do favor quail survival, that we'll have the best habitat ready for them. Hey, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Fishing. Hunting. Wildlife management. Resource protection. Habitat conservation. Public outreach. And education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. <laughs> Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job. It's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long, the employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving, and our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting-edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909, without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. But hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognized that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction to unimaginable numbers As much as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. And you can hear it on the landscape. You'll find us working hard to make your state's natural resources the most healthy in the land. We are. We are. 
We are. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Thank you.